apparition is the uh, medical term for urination. It is synonymous, but you can't use the word urination. You have to use the word micturition. I cannot explain why that is, but it is. Um, so how does micturition work? Well, it it is a hand-in-hand uh, -hand, uh, cooperation or, or, or collaboration between uh, autonomics and skeletal muscle control. So if we look here at the board, this is the bladder. The bladder is, is a smooth muscle. The smooth muscle of the bladder is called the detrusor. That's the detrusor muscle. That is what makes up the bladder. Um, and, and so this smooth muscle gets a sympathetic and autonomic input from the sacral cord. Remember that, that the autonomics from the sacral cord, we used to think that they're parasympathetic, but they're actually sympathetic. So there's an autonomic preganglionic that goes to a ganglion, ganglionic neuron that's in the wall of the detrusor, and that ganglionic neuron then can uh, contract or relax this detrusor muscle. There's also a uh, skeletal muscle involved. This is, uh, this is the external urethral sphincter. This is one of these uh, ring muscles. It's a sphincter muscle, and this is innervated by a motor neuron because it's a, it's a, a typical skeletal muscle. Um, and this is voluntarily relaxed. So you have to have a relaxation of the external urethral sphincter and a, a um, excitation of the detrusor. And th those are the um, core uh, necessities for micturition. But as you know, that uh, there's also other things that happen. Pe individuals of whatever species adopt a posture that is all skeletal muscle. So there's a posture that goes with uh, voiding urine, and that is going to be different from the posture. So if you watch a dog or a cat, you'll see, you will know whether the animal is going to void urine or void feces. They have a different posture for each uh, action. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the same, um, the same may be true of, of, well, the same is true of some humans at least. So, <clears throat> so this is a, a, a behavior that first of all needs both autonomic and needs, not can use, but needs a collaboration between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. The, the next thing to consider is that this is a, a, an action that takes place extremely rarely. So out of 24 hours in a day, there is uh, less than two minutes of that 24 hours is spent uh, voiding urine, okay? So you spend 99% of your time in urine storage, and then there has to be a closely regulated mo um, time when, when micturition occurs. That's very closely re regulated. And in uh, animals such as dogs, one of the reasons it's closely regulated is because it's a social signal, it's a territorial signal. In humans, in modern humans, it is a, um, it is a signal that is, um, so, is somehow interpreted as mental competence. That, that doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, but that is how it is. And, and, and so the unfortunate mis, uh, mistake of uh, avoiding urine at an inopportune time, at an inopportune time, at an inappropriate time, can be the trigger that sends families or sends an individual into great consternation and um, you know, so-and-so is losing it, or so-and-so must, uh, we have to do something about so-and-so. Um, okay, so th this is not necessarily a, uh, a, a sign of frontal lobe function, so, uh, so to speak. It may be a sign of um, sacral cord function, pontine function. So how does this work? What we, what we think happens is that there are two different signals that combine to trigger micturition. 
One comes from the ponds, and this is a, an area called um, Barrington's nucleus. And Barrington's nucleus, in turn, gets input from the prefrontal cortex. And Barrington's nucleus is somehow thought <clears throat> to come down here and turn off the external urethral sphincter. Um, and somehow also allow, when it turns off the external urethral sphincter, somehow allow the information from the detrusor wall, so sensory information that the detrusor is full, is, is stretched, that the bladder is full because the detrusor muscle is stretched, that information ha now gains access to the preganglionics so that you can have this reflex uh, afferent-driven contraction of the detrusor. And so you get this afferent-driven contraction of the detrusor coupled with the conscious relaxation of, of the external urethral sphincter. Once urine starts to flow through here, that information is going to, uh, is going to, in, uh, is going to increase uh, the contraction, is going to facilitate further contraction of the detrusor. So once uh, urine starts to pass, the, it will continue to pass. Okay, so that's how it normally works. Um, a, a, few, a few points here before we uh, go back to the slides. One is that uh, the prefrontal cortex, this connection where you've decided, oh, this is a good time to um, go void urine, uh, that does not, that's not developed out of, the, out of the womb, okay? So a neonate doesn't have that. A neonate develops this connection learns to do this connection within the first few years of life, okay? So that's number one. And the second thing is on the other end of life, when there might be a stroke up here or tumor up in prefrontal cortex, you can get situations where the control of micturition is, uh, is faulty. And so uh, lesions up here, uh, can give rise, the most common thing to have happen in an elderly person with some kind of impairment up in the prefrontal cortex is that they start to wet their blood, wet, wet the bed. So that's enuresis. So there's, uh, there's micturition uh, instead of urine storage during sleep. Um, and then at an extreme level, there are cases where there are people um, will urinate and in public and not care. So, so anywhere from uh, nighttime micturition, uh, uh, uncontrolled nighttime micturition, to uh, actually urinating without any social constraints. This can all uh, happen from uh, issues either in prefrontal cortex or in the, in the connection, in the case of the babies, the connection between prefrontal cortex and Barrington's. All right, so the other important thing here is the spinal cord. Obviously, for, for the message from Barrington's to get to the sacral cord, it has to go through the length of the spinal cord. It has to get all the way to sacral cord. And so what proportion of spinal cord injuries may have a problem with this? Well, a high proportion because virtually all of the all patients are going to have a, a lesion above the sacral cord. The sacral cord is the most, you know, is the bottom level of the uh, of the spinal cord. Um, now, not every lesion of the spinal cord is complete enough to cut the fibers involved, um, but um, it is a very common problem amongst spinal cord injured patients. So, w let's just compare three things. We're going to zoom in. First on up here, this is the situation with an infant. Uh, the bladder fills, and when the bladder gets to a certain uh, level, uh, there is simply a reflex, uh, a reflex micturition, a reflex void. And that is information coming from the detrusor is going to the, uh, going to contact detrusor uh, preganglionics, um, and uh, the external urethral sphincter is relaxed. In, an, in a healthy adult, 
as the bladder fills, the um, detrusor muscle get, starts to contract more and more. And when the person decides to void, they will, uh, they will start this and uh, they, will comp they will empty their bladder in that void. So they're going um, to empty it in a, in a specific period of time. In a, in a spinal cord injured patient, there is a reversion to the reflex uh, uh, voiding, but in that person, the sphincter does not relax. So in the, in the adult, there's a signal from the pons to the sacral cord, relax the external urethral sphincter, in the spinal cord injured patient, that does not happen. So what happens is that as the, as the bladder fills, there is a reflex contraction of the detrusor, but the external urethral sphincter remains closed. And this is called detrusor sphincter dysenergia. It's a big problem and it has to be treated because obviously the, first of all, the urine has to get out. Um, well, the urine has to get out. So, um, so this is, is something is one of the number one problems uh, that that uh, we have to look for in in virtually all spinal cord injured patients. Okay, so in the next uh, video, we're going to look at gastrointestinal motility. <laughs>